just under a year since the project was approved, the first of the four dams on the Klamath River has been removed. These salmon that I saw rotting and dying are my connections to my ancestors. We need electricity. We need water. What are they taking out? Long before the European explorers navigated these waters, the Kalamath River was a highway for indigenous people. Uh, we've taken these canoes places where they haven't seen canoes in like over a hundred years. Below the surface, salmon, steelhead, and cutthroat trout swam freely from the Cascade Mountains in Oregon to the Pacific Coast in California. Everything living here relies on this fish and the nutrients it brings to our system. Today, water is slowed by dams that electrify communities that live and make a living along the reservoir. Every morning I wake up to this incredible, beautiful view and it will be gone in less than two months. The presence of the lake is, um, it's a huge thing for everybody out here. Change is the only constant along the Kalamath River, and change is happening again. I was out here protesting from the time I was a little kid to undam the Klamath River, and yet we've come to a day where it's become a reality. Just below the lake community of Copco is the start of a historic demolition project. Well, this is the largest dam removal project in the entire world that's currently underway. For more than 100 years, a series of six hydroelectric dams have slowed the flow of the Klamath River to generate power for the Klamath Basin and beyond. In 2024, four of those dams will be removed. These dams were really important at the time they were constructed. They electrified this region for the very first time. Mark Bransom is the chief executive officer of the Klamath River Renewal Corporation, or the KRRC, the nonprofit entity that's in charge of the removal project. But it wasn't recognized at the time that the construction and operation of these dams was going to bring with it negative environmental uh, impacts. The six dams, or the Klamath Hydroelectric Project as it's known, were built between 1918 and 1964. Up until 2022, those very old dams were operated by power company Pacific Corp. They generate a very small amount of power. In fact, they really represent only about 2% of the generating portfolio of Pacific Corp. When Pacific Corp's licensing agreement ran out in 2006, they had the option of either repairing and updating the dams to modern standards or removing the dams altogether, which is the option they chose. They estimated that they might spend somewhere on the order of half a billion dollars to install fish passage and to do a variety of water quality improvement pr uh, processes to continue to operate the dams. And it simply didn't make economic sense. The four dams slated for removal are the J.C. Boyle Dam, which is in Oregon, and in California, the Copco 1, the Copco 2, and the Iron Gate Dam. The two dams that won't be removed or torn down are the Keno and the Link River Dam, which regulate floodwaters on the Oregon side. This is the only time in history where this river is going to heal itself. Uh, there's a lot of people that aren't with us here today that strive for this to happen as the dam's taken out. Normally, Julian Markinson wouldn't be taking a non-native person like me for a ride in a Yurok Redwood canoe. There's only about 11 of these in existence. So this is one of the rarest vessels in the world right here. The Othwayach, as they're called, are sacred vessels. But last year, the tribe had a change of heart and started offering the public two-hour tours down the Klamath to see the river through the tribe's eyes. You can't have people respect you if they don't know about you. The Yurok people primarily live near the mouth of the Klamath River, where fresh water meets the ocean. As Julian paddles along the bank, he explains, the river is in a constant state of healing itself. Dams. Uh, they're kind of the biggest culprit in making the river sick, and uh, <clears throat> it's the blue-green algae. The hydroelectric dams above the tribal lands slow water in the Klamath. In years of drought, 
plumes of blue-green algae grow in the slow-moving water and suck the oxygen out of the river. Hundreds of dead fish! Hundreds of them! In 2002, the algae caused a massive fish kill that suffocated salmon and other aquatic life in the river. You just see bodies upon bodies lining the shoreline of rotting salmon. Brooke Thompson was just seven years old when the fish kill happened. You know, these salmon that I saw rotting and dying are my connections to my ancestors, right? We've been on this river, we've been in this space for over 15,000 years, since time immemorial. Brooke is Yurok and grew up fishing salmon with her father. Those fish fed her family and the tribe. This was really like our supermarket, you know, and when the, there's low tide out here in the rocks, you can get seaweed that we eat as well. So it's kind of like everything we needed to live a healthy life. Fish need water. The fish kill led Brooke to a life of activism. She pushed for the removal of the dams at a very young age. In college, she studied environmental science, civil engineering, and political science. I'm also looking at how to better integrate indigenous knowledge into California water policies. So how can tribes communicate better with policymakers that make decisions on water? Negotiations on how to remove the dam started around 2006, and an agreement wouldn't be finalized until about 2016. But it was the activism by Brooke, her tribe, and many environmentalists that made sure policymakers didn't lose focus and that the project would follow through. You know, they were told that this wasn't going to be a reality, that we were wasting our time, that this was never going to happen, that dam removal was not going to happen on the Klamath River, and that we were pretty much fools for even trying. And yet, we've come to a day where it's become a reality. The drawdown of the dams on the Klamath started in mid-January of 2024, with a hole being blown in the side of two of them. We really like coming out here. There are a lot of professional musicians and people of, in the arts here. So it's an amazing, surprising community. The water is expected to be drained by the spring of 2024, but as the dam's reservoirs drop, new concerns are on the rise. Diatomaceous earth, crumbly, very crumbly. And that is what we are on here. We talked to Patty Vinico a few months before the drawdown. She lives on Copco Lake, about a quarter mile from the Copco Dams. Her lakeside property, like many other people's property, is about to turn into cliffside property. And there's no guarantee if our homes do tumble down that they will take care of us. Hmm. We're, we're literally, I call it collateral damage. We are collateral damage. So this is the Copco Lake store. Across the reservoir from Patty is the General Store, a business that Francis Gill and Danny Fontaine started remodeling in 2022. We're going to open this summer, um, but then when the, the dam removal was finalized last November, we decided we were going to hold off. Copco Lake is largely a vacation community with several hundred lakeside homes and about a hundred year-round residents. The town was built in the 1960s and the reservoir was the main reason families bought land here. So if you can imagine buying a, buying a house, you know, across the street from a really nice park and you bought that house because it had that really nice park across the street and then they come through and they build a freeway through that park. You can't drive around Copco Lake without seeing for sale signs around every corner. After the reservoir is drawn down, access to the new stretch of river will be difficult to get to. And there's many concerns that the nearby wells will run dry. We need electricity. We need water. What are they taking out? Four incredible, clean, producing electric dams and the most beautiful waterway, the most beautiful expanse a paradise of water. Look how much water there is. You guys drove. Whether that's simply the view that they enjoy of the lake uh, or the value of their property because of the uh, change, I think they're expressing some legitimate concerns about how the project could impact them. Concerns from Copco Lake residents and most dam-related matters are managed by the Klamath River Renewal Corporation, or KRRC. 
They don't store any water for agricultural or municipal uses, uh, and they're not operated for flood control. Pacific Corp has replaced that generating uh, power uh, many, many times over, including with renewable resources. KRRC Chief Executive Officer Mark Bransom has spent a lot of time addressing concerns and correcting misinformation about unstable soil, well issues, and fire concerns. The KRRC can't pay for lost property values, but it can help in other areas. But we've invited residents into the claims process and are providing them with some financial resources in the event that there are some impacts. What do we want? Water! The KRRC is a result of more than a decade of protests, disagreements, and negotiations involving the dam's former operator, Pacific Corp, multiple governments, tribes, and environmentalists. But nobody has ever simultaneously removed four dams uh, restored almost uh, 2,500 acres of land. The dam's removal project will cost $450 million, which is paid for by Pacific Corp's rate hikes and money from state water bonds. We have two states involved in this project, as well as the federal government and a couple of counties. And so you can imagine that the regulatory process itself was extremely complex. To streamline the process and release Pacific Corp of liabilities, all interested parties decided to form the KRRC, an independent entity that would deal with getting all the permits and approvals needed to remove the dams. Hey, we get to eat fish. How could you not be happy? You know, uh, that's one thing about a Native American, man. They, they've uh, tried to keep us down forever. We just, we're resilient. Physically removing the dam and restoring the land will take the least amount of time in this entire process, but getting to that point has taken a long time. I definitely walk around pretty proud thinking, you know, I got to be a part of this team. And, you know, and it wasn't just the tribes, it was everybody. There was a lot of stakeholders that spent many, many decades bringing these dams down. And uh, like you said, it's not done. Kenneth Brinks, or Binks as he's known, is a Karuk tribal member. He and the tribe live downstream of the dams and have been fighting for their removal since the fish kill of 2002. Today, he's treating some of the tribe to a traditional salmon feast. So it's like bringing a whole culture and religion back. That's what this means, the salmon and the dams. So a lot of people don't realize that, that the, these dams took away our culture and our religion. You know, it's like, how could that? It just takes away water, but yeah, water's our life. It's taken years to get to this point, but the tribes along the Klamath River believe the world is watching what's happening in California and in Oregon. I'm really hoping that this will be an inspiration to other groups of people where they're understanding that, you know, maybe what we're gaining with the dam is not worth what we're losing. And if the world is watching, opponents of the dam removal hope they're watching both sides. Well, all along, I think it was, we, this community definitely felt unlistened to. If this is a successful dam removal experiment, for lack of a better word, um, they're not, coming after your dams. There's, <laughs> they, they will. They're going to want to open up a lot more volitional passageways. By the end of 2024, all four dams will be removed, and salmon will once again be able to swim up the Klamath. The next step is to replant native plants and restore the land damaged by the reservoirs. But this is for the next chapter in the story of the Klamath Dam removals.